Thank you. Thank you, Raj, Via, and Frank, and Craig, and Espy, uh, for your remarks and for your gift. So it's now my honor to introduce today's commencement speaker, Cass Sunstein, one of the, most, the country's most influential legal scholars. One of the hallmarks of a Penn Law legal education is the focus on cross-disciplinary study. We believe that understanding how the law connects with science, business, medicine, and culture is a necessary part of legal education. Throughout his career, Cass Sunstein has embraced the ethic of cross-disciplinary study. His groundbreaking scholarship has drawn on an array of fields, including psychology, government, economics, and law. We often say that law school teaches you how to think, and Professor Sunstein is one of the scholars trying to figure out just why we think the way that we do. His work on behavior, especially irrational behaviors, has had significant impact on law and policy. Professor Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard Law School and the author of, at least by my count, over 30 books. The Atlantic has called him undoubtedly the most prolific legal scholar in the United States, and he has contributed significantly to the fields of constitutional law, administrative law, and behavioral economics. From 2009 to 2012, he served as the administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which plays a key role in coordinating the review of federal regulations. He is also the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law. His most recent books include Why Nudge and Conspiracy Theories and Other Dangerous Ideas, and he is currently working on a project about group decision making. Please welcome our commencement speaker, Cass Sunstein. Uh, graduates, uh, faculty, family, friends, our topic today is Star Wars. <laughs> Some of you aren't applauding. <laughs> it's not the most usual topic, I know, uh, but it's not completely random. The class of 2015 has the astounding good fortune of graduating in the very year of Star Wars Rebirth, so the topic is far more timely than it otherwise might be. Now, to get these remarks going, we need to do a little empirical research. How many of you have seen at least one of the six Star Wars movies? There we go. How many of you are looking forward with something more than modest anticipation to Star Wars 7? Okay, a lot of you know about Star Wars, but a fair number of you don't, and there's going to be one last law school class now. <laughs> Happily, this is one of the world's greatest legal institutions, and for those of you who aren't in the know, uh, you are quick learners, or parents, or friends of quick learners, at least, and you're going to have to catch up. Uh, here's a conventional, a conventional narrative about Star Wars. This is an account that's widely held. Uh, George Lucas, the mastermind of Star Wars, wrote the first episode, A New Hope, which was the first of the six movies in the sequence, though some of you know it's actually Star Wars 4. You know that, okay, great, hooray for that. Uh, many people believe that he wrote the entire tale in a book called The Journal of the Wills, The Journal of the Wills, from which the six movies were taken. And in The Journal of the Wills, he set out the full set of understandings that animated the six movies. Am I lo losing you yet? <laughs> He knew that Darth Vader, which sounds a lot, a lot like Dark Father, doesn't it? Darth Vader sounds like Dark Father. He knew from the beginning that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker, Luke Skywalker's father. He knew that at the start. He knew that Luke and Leia, you know who they are, some of you? <laughs> he knew that they were twin siblings. And he knew finally that Luke Skywalker, Vader's son, would end up redeeming his father by turning him away from the dark side. That's conventional wisdom among Star Wars aficionados. Here's the truth. 
There's no journal of the wills. Lucas did not figure it all out in advance. Much of the plot was improvisation and serendipity. The idea that Darth Vader was Luke's father? That was made up late. Apparently, Lucas wrote a scene in which he had Vader saying, we can rule the universe as father and son. That created a sunburst in his mind, and he converted them into father and son. The line, you have a sister, that was made up very late. Lucas, the author, had a problem he needed to solve. In Empire Strikes Back, some of you will remember, there was a line, there is another who has the force. That was in case Luke died or maybe the actor didn't come back. <laughs> but the actors didn't want more movies. They'd had enough and Lucas had to do something quick, so he made Luke and Leia siblings. Star Wars is a tale of redemption, the redemption of Darth Vader. That was made up late. Vader had only nine minutes in Star Wars A New Hope. Who would have thought the whole saga would be about Vader? While we're at it, here are the two greatest lines in Star Wars. This is a refresher for some of you. We're going to get to constitutional law and life soon, I promise. <laughs> the greatest line of all is when the dying Darth Vader, the father, who has been redeemed by his son, an evildoer goes good. He says as his dying lines, you were right about me. Tell your sister you were right about me. That's a great line because it has universality about parents and what children do for them. This is for you parents. It's for you graduates too, mostly for you parents. What children do for their parents is that they bring out the best in them. They redeem them for all their flaws and imperfections. So I'm speaking to you all about what you graduates have done for your parents, and they know it. Clap, parents, if you know it. Thanks, graduates. Here's the second best line. Han Solo, one of the heroes of the movie, says about his ship proudly, it's the ship that made the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. That's a really great line. Partly because it makes no sense. <laughs> there is no Kessel Run, and a parsec is a distance, not a time. Why does it work? It because, works because of the joyful narcissism with which Han Solo, Harrison Ford, delivers the line. This has no connection to my remarks, but I really like the line. <laughs> okay, now let's turn for a moment away from Star Wars to law and life. Constitutional law is one of my specialties, and on one view, the document itself is the Journal of the Wills. It's the document that lays it all out. On one view, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, there's a Journal of the Wills, and we've been kind of unfaithful to it. On another view, Justice Breyer has sometimes spoken for this view, we haven't been unfaithful to our Journal of the Wills at all. They anticipated its line of growth. They anticipated its evolution. I have some news for you, lawyers-to-be. There's no Journal of the Wills in constitutional law any more than there is in Star Wars. Here's one example. Commercial speech is protected by the free speech principle. You know that, yes? It seems like a late creation, a kind of interloper, a little bit of an I am your father moment. <laughs> Commercial speech got protected, it's true, only in 1976. But here's the bigger news, political speech too. Not until the 1960s 
nearly two centuries after the founding, did the current robust protection given to political speech in the United States get established. There were two I am your father moments, 1964, where the Supreme Court said that libel was going to be rejected, the standard law of libel by free speech principles. The court had never said that before. In 1969, when the court established for the first time, really, the clear and present danger test, 1969. Race equality, was it established in the Civil War as a constitutional matter and its aftermath? No, 1950s. Sex equality, was that a product of the movement for women's right to vote? No, 1970s. Forbidding sexual discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? This year, maybe. Constitutional law of, is full of I am your father moments. We can understand that claim a little bit with the aid of some jurisprudence, and this is your last academic material of your law school career. You're about to get those diplomas. There's a metaphor produced by Ronald Dworkin, the great legal theorist, of a chain novel, where each judge and the lawyers who motivate the judges is producing a new chapter in a chain novel. That's what our law is, a chain novel. That metaphor, I think, is fundamentally correct, but it downplays the fact that nothing that happens is inevitable. There is an immense role for serendipity and reversals which after the fact we call continuity and we work really hard to construct it. We see patterns in our law, but we are responsible for them. We're not finding them, we're creating them. That's what law is. With a little push or pull in our legal system, everything could be different. Now life. There's no journal of the wills in personal life either. You just can't write a script. Think of your own life and its progress over the last six years. Ask your parents to reflect on your life over the last 15. Serendipity and accident everywhere. Here's the good news. Actually, it's great news. Your life is like a chain novel too, and you get to be the author. Here's a little story for you about the role of serendipity in life. A number of years ago, I was at the University of Chicago in our little law library, and a friend of mine um, mentioned that we should think about hiring some new person he'd been working with, a student who had edited his article. And uh, I, I said, what's, what's the guy's name? And he says, completely fantastic, and you're not going to believe his name. I said, what, what's his name? Barack Obama. As a result of that conversation, a uh, certain youngster became a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And who knows, without at least a number of serendipities, whether his march to the presidency would have proceeded as it ended up doing. Think about the following question. How did you get here? There's an astounding chain of coincidences that made this day possible. I did a little research on the likelihood that any one of you would be born. <laughs> it's really low. <laughs> and that's not because the likelihood that you would be born is low. It's that the biological likelihood that any one of us would get to exist, it's really small. It's one over a large number. Think now about the fact that you ended up in law and the course that brought you here. What little twist or turn, I'm hoping you can think of a few, if they twist or turn the other way, would have brought you on another course? There are a lot of twists and turns that are a result of accident and serendipity that brought you here. I know the fact that I'm giving this not usual talk is a product of serendipity. A relatively new friend happened to hand me the disc for episode four of Star Wars a few weeks ago. <laughs> there we go. 
Here's my last theme. George Lucas, the author of Star Wars, originally, and I think consciously, wanted to write a Stoic or Buddhist script. Now I'm going to explain that. The script he meant to write, influenced by his reading, was about the problems introduced by human attachments and connections. Darth Vader, the evil one, goes to the dark side for one reason. He's unwilling to let go of his attachments to his mother and then to his beloved. The ostensible theme, which Lucas had very much in his mind, is that intense connections are bad because they lead to terrible things on the part of the person who loses the thing to which you're attached. That is a Stoic theme. And Yoda, some of you know Yoda, says roughly this, fear, fear of loss, leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to the dark side. That's the ostensible theme. But Lucas is unconscious. I think his deepest self was a lot more interesting than that. Redemption in the arc of the movies comes not in spite of connections, but because of them. When Darth Vader is redeemed in the end, it's because, for one reason, he can't bear to see his son die. The very thing that leads to the march to the dark side, fear of loss, is what produces his redemption. That's what makes Darth Vader in the end good. Lucas's unconscious was deeply alert to the beauty and the joy in connection, notwithstanding his ostensible commitment to the Stoic theme that connection is the path to darkness. You can see the tension, I think, in a very obscure, what has this law professor Sunstein been researching lately? You might be asking yourself. It's a good question. You can see the tension in the genesis of the tale, where there's just a little bit of dialogue I'm going to tell you. Lawrence Kasdan, a brilliant screenwriter, is saying to George Lucas, in a way of trying to deepen the narrative, I'm saying that the movie has more emotional weight. If someone you love is lost along the way, the journey has more impact. George Lucas, the author, says, I don't like that, and I don't believe that. I confess I love Lucas's response. It's so automatic. I don't like that, and I don't believe that. But in his narrative, suggests, whether or not I like it, I believe it. More emotional weight if someone you lo lo love is lost along the way. The journey has more impact. Okay, in government, I was in government for four years. I learned a bunch of jargon words. One of them is deliverables. Some of you know the word deliverables. Okay, I'm going to give you four deliverables by way of conclusion. In law and life, there is no journal of the wills. That's number one. Number two, you are going to have plenty of I am your father moments. Trust me on that. They are going to cast your whole life's narrative in a new light. There will be losses and gains and revelations. Some won't be so great, I'm sorry to say. Some are going to be completely awesome. Sometimes they will be not so great and awesome at exactly the same time. Most of them are going to be awesome. Third, when people are difficult, even the most difficult, even maybe Sith lords, <laughs> for the people who don't know this stuff yet, Sith lords, bad. <laughs> When they're Sith Lords, evil, bad, difficult, you might see something in them, a look in the eye. And you might, like Luke Skywalker, treat them a certain way, a good way. And you might eventually hear from them some kind of, you were right about me. They might not say it, but you can help make it true, and it will be true. Martin Luther King said, there is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. 
I take that not just as a descriptive statement, it's a mission statement. Make it so. Fourth and last point, connections are really, really good, even or especially if they produce or entail a fear of loss. I'm done. The force is strong with you all. <laughs> May your ships make the Kessel run in much less than 12 parsecs. Congratulations to the Jedi Knights of 2015.